So Aaron? how do we begin? Uh, do do I just start, or do you? Just... You are. It's your your it's your floor now. It's your <laughs> your discussion to start. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the book, but by little bit I mean a little bit, because what I've learned to do and it works really well is to do discussions. That I ask, uh, I have a moderator. Um, I, is that Ted? I think so. Who will select yep. who will select people uh, for questions in the chat or raising your hand, whatever means he wants to use. But what I like is when someone asks a question, that the person stays there because we may have a follow up question, or I may want to ask them to clarify something, uh, or I may even want to ask them a question. And so it's it's going to be a discussion. And this I like it much better. It's much more friendly than me giving a canned lecture. But I'll tell you essentially the reason I wrote the book. Uh, well, I've written many books, as many of you know. You only know half of them because only the last half were about design. And uh they're all books about how to make things easier to understand, easier to use, et cetera, or beautiful perhaps. And those are very important and I think they're very useful, but it won't change the world. And I felt that the world is in a pretty miserable state right now. And wouldn't it be nice if we could do something about it? And what is it that we could do about it? And it's not at all clear what we can do. Uh, and so I decided that I was going to address that. And I spent several years educating myself about issues. And I wrote this book, which talks about the problems we're having today and the history, how we came here. And I mentioned the fact that, you know, the old saying that uh, if you don't know history, uh, you're condemned to repeat history. Well, that's false. History doesn't repeat itself. But the physical sciences have this nice property that it's stateless, it's, it, it's state independent, it's path independent. How it got to the current state doesn't matter. If I pick up something and drop it, and I pick it up again and drop it, the fact that I dropped it once before makes no difference about how it will behave now. But uh, animate things are different. And so how do we design for humans, for people? That's the hard part. That's really hard. In fact, there's an old saying that uh, um, unfortunately many of the sciences have accepted, which is if you can't measure something, you can't, it means you don't understand it. And it was Lord Kelvin who said that. And so uh, the economists believe that so much that they measure everything, even though they can't really measure it, they measure whatever they can measure, and they usually measure it in terms of money. Well, that isn't quite what Lord Kelvin said. Lord Kelvin said, in the physical sciences, if you cannot measure, it means you don't understand. And physical sciences are path independent, not the social sciences, not humanity, not people. And so that's why it's a hard problem. And today's problems are highly technical. And many people are writing wonderful books about how to solve it through technology. But those aren't the fundamental problem. The fundamental problems are human behavior. And so this book is about just a couple of topics that I thought I had some special uh, insight because I'm a trained as an engineer, electrical engineer. Um, I've also been a psychologist, also a cognitive scientist. Now I'm a designer. I've been an uh, executive in, uh, in companies. And so I put together the topics that I thought I had a, some special perspective on, leaving out many of the things that are wrong in the world. But well, it's already a pretty thick book. So that's what I'm gonna talk about today, but only if you ask me the right questions. So I'm gonna now throw it open to the floor to answer questions. Yeah. So please everybody uh, raise your hand and I'll try to call on you as, and, and uh, include everybody um, as well as I can. Can I go, Ted? Sure, I... Jim, please do. Can't quite get my hand raised in time, but hey, Don. Um, hey, everyone. Hey, Don. Recently, I started researching the history of safety engineering. You know, and and I I, I love your current book, but when I asked Bard about the top books in safety engineering, one of the first books that came up was 
your book on the human factor revolutionizing the way we live, work, and play by Don Norman. And I would love to just hear you <laughs> to talk a little bit about safety in this current era. It's It seems like we get a technology, a bunch of companies commercialize it, and then we have to go into the safety mode of government regulation because you know, there's safety concerns and harms that aren't being addressed. And that that cycle of new technology, businesses, harms, government regulation comes over and over again. And I think that's that's how society deals with this stuff of progress. And I'm just wondering if that's enough of a, of a prompt for you to talk to us a little bit about your views on safety engineering. Well, that's interesting. Um... But I'm going to generalize because the very issues you talk about are true in many, many different fields. It's why we don't worry about the environment, why we weren't ready for the pandemic, why, um, why we don't treat workers better. And so it all has to do with sort of our history, which and, and the history of our country is really the history of Europe and the history, especially of England. And um, we... We've actually, the, the, the system that we have evolved capitalism into is that profit is the major thing of concern. And so profit has driven a lot of the issues that you mentioned. So there are other things as well is that, and again, I, all of this is covered in the book, which is that we have a very simplistic notion of causality. Uh, we do something and there's an immediate response. And so this must have caused that. And we don't realize that in many things, especially accidents and safety, there are multiple causes. Uh, that the National Transportation Safety Board, which examines all transportation accidents, which includes, by the way, oil pipes. Um, and uh, they're very good at doing an analysis and they never say that this is the reason. They will usually say there are five or six things that went wrong and perhaps if, if any one of them had not happened, there would not have been an accident. So how can you blame, how do you know who caused it? Well, that's the way systems are. Systems are very complex. And Jim has studied that at great length and can tell you about it, but we have feed forward loops and feed back loops and we have nonlinear loops and we have huge time delays. Um, I point out in the book that if you use your air conditioner, you cause the atmosphere to warm up, which requires you to use the air conditioner even more, but it may, but you say, it's just one little air conditioner. What can it do? Well, there are 3 billion in the world. And second, it may take 10 years to have the impact. And that is really hard for people to understand. Safety almost always is blamed on the people. And I've, I've studied this uh, at great length, actually, for a while. Um, human error and almost always is design error. I was called in as a consultant to a big electric utility because uh, their workers were being were electrocuting themselves, if you will, touching the high voltage inappropriately. And um, there were several cases where the person was so dedicated to the job that they were focusing on what they were trying to do and they neglected to be, you had to be a minimum of three feet from one of the high voltage connectors. And uh, what happened is he got closer. Now, so then he doesn't remember that he tells, but he did wake up in the hospital. And fortunately he wasn't killed, but he said, that was my fault, I did a stupid thing. And the problem is, is that, the problem is that the, the people, the, the, the company treats it that way, that it's the person's fault, they need more training. And I tried to point out that when you're very busy doing this task, how do you know how close your head is to that, uh, to that high voltage thing there? And I said, well, why don't you just have this little cardboard fold out that you can carry in your truck and you put it and you just put it around the transformer. And so it just blocks you. It's inexpensive, very simple. And they said, yeah, that's, that's very clever, but they never did anything. And uh, it turns out they've had brought enough a group of different experts. I was along uh, one of a main big chain and all of us experts said the same thing to the company. Now I would pass by, I took pictures of this door that says this must be kept shut and it's wide open. And, uh, and there's all sorts of other things that they violated. They have signs and people violated it. And I would say, why is that? 
oh, that's an old sign. Uh, we've changed it. And But it's if you see things that you can disobey, how do you know which ones you can disobey and ones you can't? And the whole, the whole thing was wrong. And I, I met with the top executives and we talked about, have you ever turned on the wrong burner in your stove? Oh, yeah. Well, that's a design problem of the stove. They could understand that, but they couldn't relate it. And I think that's been true in a company's aims at profit. And so it, it, if they spitting out waste into the rivers and the oceans and the, the land and the air, um, well, that's an externality. It doesn't, it doesn't tell it against us. And it would be really expensive to fix that. Well, that isn't true. The same with the way you treat your workers. Uh, there's, there's the last issue of the AAAS, a magazine called Dedulous. It's all about um, these issues. And they point out that companies, the chicken companies, that, where the people stand on the assembly line and are chop, you know, collecting, chopping up the chickens, one company treats them like uh, robots, basically. Low pay, they have to work hard, they have to keep to their hours, they get very short breaks, they're not treated like people. The other company treats them like people and they have longer breaks and their health care is paid for. And if they get ill, they're encouraged to stay home. That they're required to stay home and they're still paid, et cetera. And it turns out that they're, the company that treats them as like people is doing better than the other company because in terms of productivity over an hour, the ones that treat you like an animal or like a robot is doing better, but that doesn't take into account transitions, people quit or injuries or actually badly done jobs, which then cause the company great loss. Uh, you know, if you, you send out diseased chickens, uh, that costs you billions of dollars. Um, but it's this whole mindset. I could go on, but it's a whole mindset. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, um, uh, the, the, the um, stockholders of Costco um, uh, sued Costco because they're paying their workers a dollar more than Safeway. And Costco pointed out that their, uh, that their churn rate, that means how many people, um, are changing hands, I'm um, changing jobs was one tenth of of Safeway. Uh, so it's it's an amazing amazing opportunities when you treat people well. Terry Winograd is, seems to have but, a question here. But before we do that, before we do that, um, yes, the the real issues facing us are human behavior, and it's going to be very difficult to change. And it's unfortunate that there was a the mode of, of economics was that a company did not own, did not have any responsibility for its workers or its customers or the environment in which it was located, but to the shareholders. Now, and the people getting MBAs have all been taught that, but actually that's not true. It is not necessary. And act that's starting to change, but the economic driver has been very, very bad for uh, society. Okay, Terry. I had a question that was triggered by something you said a little while ago about causality and single causes. I just, I see Paul Pangaro here on the call. I just recently renewed a discussion with him about cybernetics. Uh, and that's of course, one of the big points of cybernetics. Do you see the field of cybernetics and the literature and the tradition of cybernetics playing a big role in the kinds of changes you want to see? Yes. Um because it's interesting that when I was a student <laughs> a long time ago, in the 1950s, an undergraduate student in engineering, I actually was a fan of Norbert Wiener, uh, the guy who invented cybernetics. And I read all his books and even bumped into him in the hall once, literally bumped into him by accident. Uh, but, um, but we didn't, so control theory, for example, was, was widely studied in the early years of, of this business, but it, it I remember I decided I didn't know how to use that. And so I didn't, I sort of discarded the control theory and went on to the cognitive revolution, which was linear. We actually, we never looked at a feedback loop. We just said, oh, the, in, the stimulus comes in or it hits the eye or the ear, and then we transform it to understanding, et cetera. And in fact, the, the same with the neuroscientists. There were all those, there were afferents and efferents, that is, Lots of nerves went from the eye towards the brain, but a large number of them went from the brain back to the eye and nobody knew what it did. 
Uh, and it, nowadays we realize those are really important feedback loops. And so uh, cybernetics has, has come alive again in the United States. It was always alive in Europe, but second order cybernetics especially are really critical, I think, to understanding these complex systems. And so, uh, yes, I hope it comes back. That I, I was part of a discussion group in writing the book because I discovered Terry's book, which I had already discovered when he first wrote it, Terry at Wintergrad and Flores, Understanding Computers and Cognition. And, uh, but I read it again and I said, ooh, this is highly relevant today. And so Terry talked to Flores and so Flores talked to me and, and I heard Flores and I said, you, this sounds like, it's like somebody I've been reading a lot of, Arturo Escobar. And so Flory says, no, Arturo was one of my students. And so we started this discussion group. And we met for over a year, a year and a half, two years, every week. And that actually, I actually asked our, um, Flores about cybernetics. And that was one of the important influences, he said, in the work that he's doing. Flores is interesting. He was finance minister in Chile, uh, but in the Allende government. So he was, was overthrown by the military and he spent a number of years in jail. And he came out and ended up at Berkeley getting a PhD where, in philosophy where he met Terry. But it's, uh, it was a real, that group was very, very influential in my writing of this book. So uh, Ben, Hello, Don, and hello to Ted Selker, and thank you for putting this on, and Baykai, and all the Baykai crew. I see Nancy Frischberg and other familiar faces. Um, I thank you for your book, which I have just finished yesterday uh, to prepare for today, and there's a lot of very interesting um, discussions in there that I appreciate. I wanted to focus on the section about meaningfulness and your uh, emphasis on dashboards, which I was delighted to see. Um, and you give some examples that are simple ones, but I wanted to push further about what dashboards really were like. And the two stages of dashboards would be the first that they become visual. They could be dashboards. You you talk about automobile dashboards, which have a, a, a visual style of design, but visual dashboards are an important one. And then interactive ones. The capacity to explore is what information visualization tools have brought us. And so while I like your dashboard description, I really wanted to expand it and give it a lot more, a lot more emphasis. Yeah, uh, you could write the entire book on that topic. And so, when I, was, when I was exploring economics, I was concerned about the, the gross domestic product number that is so widely used. It's widely condemned by leading economists, but nobody stops using it. And um, one of the problems with it is it measures everything. It measures the spending of a company or a country. And it doesn't matter whether it's spending for good or spending for evil. In fact, if you spend to pollute the water, it counts twice because you spend money and you pollute the water and then you spend extra money to clean the pollution. <clears throat> hey, that's good for the GDP. And, and the notion that one number should summarize such a complex endeavor as the economy of a country, it seemed crazy. And I discovered Donut Economics, which is a group of economists in uh, Oxford who have a, a very nice graphic way of taking, on the outside of the donut, you demonstrate uh, things that are important for the ecology. And on the inside of the donut, you have other things that are important for, this, for society, societal issues. Now, so what you've done there, that's a quick dashboard because it lets you look and you want to compare countries. You don't compare the total GDP. You can say, ooh, they're really good on sustainability, but they're really bad on healthcare. <laughs> and you can compare them on these things. Now, in, in actuality, if you actually go to their website and see what they've done, they allow you to go deeper and deeper. And in fact, on the website, if you just hover over one of the points, it expands and tells you more information. And you can go deeper and deeper because the, basically the way that this works in a company is the chief executive likes to see a simple dashboard about some of the major things they care about. And that may change from day to day, but basically it's just a simple one because that tells them what's good and where they need to pay attention. 
Now, the CEO he seldom has time to pay attention, but you can say, you can then tell the relevant person who works for you to pay more attention to this. And that person then goes and they open up their dashboards, which are a more detailed expansion of what is a concern. But once again, they delegate it down lower and lower. And so, I mean, one of the things you've done, Ben, is you've explored the various ways of taking uh, dynamic, dynamical uh, illustration to allow you to go deeper and deeper and deeper. But I couldn't do that. I mean, I wasn't even allowed to print in color, let alone have that happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are lots of examples of real tools and commercial ones like Tableau, which are widely used, that do these things. So, you know, the simple example you have in the book, what I would have really loved to have was a slider that would allow me to go back in time or forward in time and see how those arrows change in their size over time or allow me to compare two countries, as you say, side by side or two, you know, two different situations or segments of the population. The point is that real problems, as you say, have many dimensions to them. And a single static image only gives you one picture, one part of the story. Uh, whereas if you can support the interaction and the exploration, you get a lot more. So I'm sort of a great fan of doing these interactive visualizations that allow tuning to, sp to specific problems and allow the, the user to be creative in, in creating new kind of visualizations that were never thought of before. Well, I claim your statement showed me that the book was successful. <laughs> because it looks, a, it's a big, thick book. And I only covered that, some of these issues, only to the same extent that you are complaining about. But that's the whole point. I wanted to activate your mind and the minds of my readers who can say, that's a really interesting issue. Uh, but it, it isn't deep enough. So let me explore it deeply and maybe make contributions there. Right. So your, um, your description is exactly what is needed, absolutely. But that wasn't what this book was going to be about. Yeah, so I kind of see this, you know, we used to have uh, reports, you know, that tell us what happened. And then we have dashboards with a bunch of dials on them. And then, and then Ben's pushing for really a machine that we're creating that lets us organize and compare things relative to our interests, which is a lot more, uh, which is really a, a very exciting direction to go from there. There are all these wonderful science fiction movies where the, somebody stands in front of big screens and waves their hands and picks a variable and then pulls it out and rotates it and expands it and so on. And yeah, that's what we do. Not necessarily but, the way they As long as we don't movies. disorient ourselves from making a mess out of our, out of our dashboard on the way. Elaine had a question or a statement she wanted to make. Elaine Hay. Okay, thank you. I'm much more novice than everybody else here, but um, I like to think about climate change and I always talk about conservation as a huge factor and not having to build more um, energy and uh, use more, dig more oil out of the ground. And product design is so much of a part of that, um, turning, having TVs that turn off, cable uh, modems that don't stay on 24 seven and cars that don't idle and lights. There's huge, there's so many people that think that they are environmentalists and organizations that do, and they leave huge office buildings with their lights on, people that don't know how to turn the screen off on their cell phone. And so I'm wondering how, you know, the only answer I can come up with is how to change the, is to change the price of energy. And I'm wondering if you have other ideas. Well, those of course are very well-known problems and there are lots of people with very good solutions. Um, there's, I just read his really nice book, which says, unfortunately, I don't remember the title. It was something like, I, I was, the book was a very good book. It was talking, it says, everything should be wind, water, or solar. And uh, he made, he, and he really demonstrated why that would be effective and that we should not ever say that, oh, but we all need fossil fuels to, to tide us over until we can get the other cells going. Because he pointed out that to build a new fossil fuel 
say electric generating plant will take 10, 15, 20 years. And by that mm -hmm. time, we could have built the solar stuff because it's much cheaper and easier, requires less permissions and less issues. Um, and he just went through it very, very strongly. But the issues are very complex because uh, the way that we make the products, uh, this is a good example uh, of a really useful and nice product, but it it's really harms the environment when we when we mine to get the materials to make it. We harm the environment when we with the way we manufacture it and spit out garbage into the sky, into the land, into the waters. We harm the tra the environment because we can't repair it. It's even difficult to change the battery. And so uh, we have, it only lasts two or three years and we throw it away because it's too difficult to open up and take out the, the valuable materials in it and reuse it. And that causes fires and fumes and all sorts of difficulties. And why does that happen? And, you know, in 1971, the designer Victor Papadak said, there is no field more dangerous than design. And they said, oh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's one field worse, and that's advertising, because it causes people to buy the horrible stuff that designers make. Well, he was both right and wrong. He was wrong to blame designers, because designers are not in the situation of power where they have any say about what is being made. And so this is like everything. It's a system, a very complex system. And the sort of issues you talked about uh, on the one hand, yeah, you can learn to not to use the lights or to switch everything to LED lights and et cetera, et cetera. But um, it's human behavior. The hardest thing to control is human behavior. And companies are very concerned about profit because they think profit is the most important thing in the world. And so if you try to make things that will last longer, they will say, oh, it's not only is it more expensive, but our whole sale, our whole company is based on selling things every two or three yeah. years. So you have to change their business models. And if they're and if they even try to change for the good, they may become uncompetitive because it costs them a bit more money to start with. They'll save money in the long run. But people are rewarded for the short-term benefits, not the long term. And so it's a very complex system. Many people who write about this, Bill Gates is a good example, who studied the technological issues and had really good suggestions, but ignored politics. But all this is political, the way that we actually can manage to change behaviors through appropriate government regulation. That's how we got safety into cars. And that's why we, how we managed to get LEDs adopted and incandescent lights are phased out. And so um, these are really difficult, complex problems and they involve more than just a simple act. I always get annoyed when I'm told that I'm wasting water by leaving it on a little bit too long or, and so on. And um, you know where most of the water goes? Most of the water is, is evaporated before it's even used. And most of it is used by agriculture and by manufacturing. And both, we could use that water more efficiently, but actually there's no penalty. The, the, the cost of water is too, too low for farmers to, for them to ex be able to afford to do anything good about it. And mm -hmm. so instead of building billion dollar desalinate um, systems or you know, these, whatever, removing the salt from water to make it drinkable, why not give billions of dollars for the farmers to cover the canals and to do drip irrigation? Um, and, but, I can go on and on and on, but the real important problem is that everything you talked about is well known in the uh, sustainability literature, but it's this complex system, the thing that Jim Spore is so excellent at, that has to be addressed, and very few people do that. And still, I think it's a wonderful um, hobby of mine uh, and of many people to, to actually savor the water. I, I washed my car today with water I got from my off of my roof, for example. And uh, I flush my toilets that, uh, from water I, I used for washing my body. Anyway, it's not a big deal, as you say, Don. It, the agriculture is a big deal, but we have to, but unless we're aware of it, we can't solve problems. Well, I'll tell you why it is a big deal for you, uh, for people's behavior, because there are 8 billion people on the planet. So even small things that each of us does adds up to a huge impact to the world. Thank you, I agree. Um, John, would you like to, John Boyden, Boykin, would you like to go speak? Sure. Um, so Don, I, um, 
as a designer, I have no shortage of uh, ideas of things that I would love to do that are socially beneficial. Um, but not being independently wealthy, um, I do things that I get hired to do. Uh, some client needs to pay me to do them. And they tend not to hire me to do the things that are socially beneficial. For example, in um, when a vaccine first came out for COVID, there was a desperate scramble to uh, to get signed up to get a vac to get vaccinated, and the the systems for doing it were dreadful. They were just horrible, and so I designed things like that all day long. Uh, so I volunteered to design one that could be you know nationally used, a standard simple one, and. I'm just a guy. I knock on Google's door and I say, hey, would you please, you know, provide the, the developers and the funding and the marketing to get the word out about this? Absolute silence. I'm just a, some clown knocking on their door. Um, as much as I would love to do socially beneficial stuff, is there some alternative to doing what the clients hire me to do? Not really. Uh, and that's the problem that the design profession faces. And so actually, <clears throat> this, this may sound like I'm avoiding the, the question, but I'm not. I, as when I said that um, Papanoff's blamed designers, I said no, because designers are in the middle level of a company. Because design is, everybody seems to think design is making things beautiful. And, um, and that's not at all what we're about. And we actually are supposed to understand the customers better than almost any other discipline, but um, we're not in a position of power. Now, why not? How come engineers get, get promoted to be high level executives and CEOs and marketing people get, and lawyers and, econ and you know financial people? Why not designers? And I think it, I blame designers. I blame the educational designers. And I blame that they're self-focused on their wonderful designs. But if you want to get moved up in the hierarchy of a company, you have to actually understand the company and think more broadly. You need to know history. You need to know politics. You need to know business. You need to know about human behavior. You need to know a wide variety of topics. And so we need to train people better. But it isn't, that isn't even necessary because people can train themselves. If we can get more people with this understanding up in the higher ranks, then we might actually be able to change things. Now, you know, the Rocky Mountain Institute, now called RMI, has actually shown how um, one of their philosophies is you cannot convince a company to do something because it's for the good of the world. Y yes, you can convince them and they might actually do it until some economic problem occurred and then they would go back to their old ways. What you have to do is show them that the way they're behaving is losing money, that the stuff that goes out in the air and the land and the seas is money. And if you can prevent that, you can actually lower your costs. And so by showing them that there's economic benefits to behaving well, then they will change and they'll stay changed. And so, but that requires somebody with a broader view of things and somebody at a level of authority where they can actually implement it. So I'm, I'm, I'm on a big mission to try to change the way designers are educated and to have ed designers educate themselves, just like engineers educate themselves. I once tried to explain this to designers that they didn't know enough. And I said, well, how come engineers go up in position? They were also trained as specialists. And someone complained, well, they won't go and get MBAs. Yeah, all right, why don't you? And uh, so, yes, if designers can't complain unless they take the act themselves to get into a position where they can say something. But it isn't enough to say you're doing harm. You have to have a good solution, a solution that allows a company to stay in business. And oftentimes the business models of today are based upon uh, designed obsolescence. And so you have to change that to maybe it's going to be a, a, a service model. So um, it's a very, it, all these are very complex problems because again, we live in this complex socio-technical system that we call the world. And we have to understand that system in order to make changes. Yeah, but, but Don, I also think like last week, somebody asked me, how should I sell cars? And I said, by advocating the buyer. And when somebody asked me, how do I sell, um, what do you call it, um, uh, lottery tickets a couple of weeks ago, I said, by, by helping people visualize what their life would, what, what they can make their life into and how they can help 
and make the dreams that really matter to them about the world happen. So, I mean, even with these extremely... Um, so you, you, want know, to do, you want to do evil by selling lottery tickets where the likelihood of winning is so low that it's basically they're wasting their money and it's the very poor people who buy most of these lotteries? Absolutely. That's, that's what's awful. That's exactly why. So you're given this terrible design problem, right? Which you just described. And then the question is, as a designer, if you're lucky, you can express to the people that are going to do it, how they can use all that incredibly awful advertising to help people visualize a world they want to be in instead of uh, dissipating themselves as they do. when they, when they win those things, they don't usually do very well, actually. I'm just saying you can turn some of these lemons. Sometimes you can turn lemons into lemonade. That's all I'm saying. No. Uh, I have a feeling this is going to be a longer discussion. So let's let's move. So on. there's uh, Sar Sartik uh, wants to uh, Sar Sartak. I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. Please tell us. Hi, uh, it's Sartak. Um, yeah, pl pleasure to be here. I just wanted to. Um, ask one thing which is kind of uh, related to what Don was just mentioning about a service. Um, my question is like, what's your experience with um, today that many products are moving towards this subscription-based model where everything is a subscription, right? Uh, starting from printers to even robots to cars, everything is a subscription-based model. So I wanted to get your take on what do you think about this and uh, have you, have you, use anything yourself or, or where do you see it going? Well, you can't answer the question about a particular method. You have to look at a particular usage. <laughs> so um, the notion that um, if, I want a, if I want a car with, where I can heat the seats, I have to I, I bought the car, but now to get the heater turned on, I have to subscribe. And so every month I have to pay a fee so that I'll have heated seats. Um, that's crazy. That's just pure uh, greed on the part of the manufacturer. But but subscription models do make sense for lots of things. I mean, we we have a subscription model for buying, paying for power and paying for water and paying for garbage collection and paying for... Uh, magazines and newspapers and lots of services. And uh, even in the early days of the telephone, we it was a subscription model. We paid monthly for the phone service and the phone company guaranteed that our phones would always be in working order. Uh, that was a good thing in many ways, it, it, though it was, it was also a monopoly, so it also stopped any progress. But um, so a, script, a subscription model can be a good model, but it can also be misused. And I think we have to change the profit motive to one that's, we want to actually do good in the world. And, and I, instead of measuring the profitability of a company, we should measure the, the, um, the quality of life that it is producing in the people that it's building things for or doing things for. And a subscription model sometimes work well, and sometimes it's a, it's it's just a way of gauging, you know, gouging more money out of people. A bad example of subscription model is the way that uh, cable TV works today. Uh, that it gets more and more and more expensive, and that's there. It's and it, it's not based upon what the real costs are. It's based upon what it is you manage to get out of the customers. So um, every model. Every sensible model that exists has its good points and its bad points, and subscription is just like that. Um, but I, I can see, though, that a company that is making products and making their money by every two years, this goes bad, and I have to buy a new one, uh, or two or three years. Or the automobile business used to be that way. They would make a new model change every year, a minor one, but every five years or so, they would make a major one. And the goal was that you would have to buy your car every new, at least every five years, because they make such a change that people could tell that you were driving an older car and, ooh, shame on you. Well, that's crazy, just crazy. In fact, a lot of academics are proud of the fact that they're driving 20-year-old cars. But, um, but, the pro but the other reason, the other way of making it required to buy a new one, I just bought a new car. My old car was 10 years old, worked perfectly fine. But it is true that with time, the safety features have improved dramatically. 
And so I bought the car particularly so because it had such wonderful new safety features. And at my age, I know the statistics that um, I, I, I needed them. So if I want to change lanes, the car can see better than I can because the car has cameras all around it and radars all around it. Whereas I barely looking around to see whether there's something in my blind spot is really hard. So again, but could the car be a subscription? Well, maybe so, because I don't use the car all the time. So when I'm not using it, why shouldn't somebody else use it? And I get the car when I need it. Once again, I only talk about difficult problems in this book because the, the most important problems are also the most difficult. And what you just raised, which seemed like a simple question about subscriptions, is a really difficult, complex business and, for that matter, moral issue. Very interesting. Uh, so I, anyway, Eleanor uh, is uh, up next. Do you want to? Definitely. Um, so my question is around how can we help people handle multiple values? And specifically, my argument is user-centered design is pretty uh, easy to implement because it's simple. But just a second. Um, you have a really bad echo. I'm trying to read it because I can't understand your spoken speech. Do you have a, a, maybe you could turn off the speakers or lower them or something? Try again. Eleanor? So in the chat, she says, you how, can, that, we help designers, how can we help designers handle multiple values simultaneously? Oh, um, I mean, actually that's a fairly standard design issue. Almost always in design, you're faced with constraints, multiple constraints, sometimes incompatible constraints. And uh, you, we always have to make trade-offs. And the clever, the clever designer can often find a solution that manages the constraints without a trade-off. But most of the time we have to uh, decide upon the values. So um, I'm trying to remember a good one. Um, it's maybe it's, I used to have some really good examples of that, but there's, um, well, let's, I, I'll give you a different design trade-off. Um, when we had COVID, badly, the scientists would tell us what the problems were and what their solutions were. And so uh, there's a, there was a big fight about whether people, politicians would listen to the scientists or not and follow the scientific advice they would say. And I say, no, it's wrong to follow the scientific advice because the scientists are good at understanding the issues, but actually in COVID, they didn't understand the issues. They would give you the best advice that they knew at the moment. And the reason the scientists kept changing their minds is because they're scientists. And when they learn more, they would obviously change their minds. That's the correct thing to do, but it really hurt the, uh, their prestige because people don't understand this nature of science. Second, there is a trade-off, a very difficult one between the economic life uh, of people, and for that matter, the educational value of going to schools uh, and the, and the the problem was faced by the COVID illness. And uh, which comes first? Is it, is it the economics of people? Do we shut down everything like China has done where they really devastated the communities for a long time to keep people completely isolated? Or should we just keep it open? So we, do we say, just keep going your normal business and then lots and lots of people get sick or even die. And it's those two, those are the two extremes. And how do, how do you balance those two? And that's actually a political question. So in the theory where politics is considered a good thing, where politics is all about taking people with different points of view and trying to figure out some reconciliation of what's best for this particular community or this particular time, um, there should be a government or a political issue to make that decision uh, because there is no correct answer. It's a balance that you, it's going to hurt no matter which way you go. And so the same thing that comes with designers who have to make this choice be, 
Um, and you often are forced between cost and your desire for improvements, or you have a, a particular design where it may be uh, incompatible with previous designs from the same company, which might cause confusion to consumers. Um, and so, uh, but fighting these different conflicting uh, constraints is standard line of business for, for designers. There's a response, Don, uh, that Eleanor put in the chat. You can look at it. Um, it feels we keep piling values onto designers, all sorts of things we have to take care of, et cetera, et cetera. Well, yeah, that's right. But it is not for a single person. Almost everything that, that has those kinds of problems, and let's take the automobile as an example, because the automobile requirements, the regulatory requirements in automobiles are horrendous. They're just, in fact, and the worst problem is every country in, in the United States, every state has different requirements somewhat. And so building an automobile is really difficult and you have to balance uh, fuel efficiency and safety and performance and comfort and et cetera. And, um, but it's a team that is doing it, a large team. And you do what you have is you have experts on each of those various dimensions. And then those experts have to be able to figure out how to get together and make a final decision. But that's where the management comes in. It's this management that has to figure out how to reconcile the different values. And, and sometimes it's regulatory. That is, you can't just skip safety. Um, but as, as uh, Jim Spore asked in the first question, uh, many companies, since safety isn't regulated as well as it ought to be, many companies skip safety because they save money. So it's a complex issue, but... Um, Yes, but designers have many different things they have to worry about, but there's nothing special about designers. The engineers are the same problem. And an interesting thing, by the way, is most, most professions like engineering and medicine, which has the same kind of balance problem, have ethical requirements. And you're taught ethics when you're trained to be a designer or a professional engineer. I'm sorry, you, to be a mil, uh, doctor or a professional engineer. Ethics is absent in our training of designers. And you need is this, that, that becomes often, how do you figure out what to do? It's often an ethical issue. And we don't even require that of designers. The design societies don't require, don't even have ethics statements, most of them. Yeah. So that's well, something what, else that's lacking. What, what I find interesting about the word ethics is that lawyers take a course on ethics and it means a very different thing. I'm just wondering, does your book speak to ethics um, and... Uh, or, or do you want to say, say more about ethics and how, how people can think about it better? No, uh, it doesn't speak about ethics because that's sort of a book. <laughs> I'd see, um, first of all, different societies have different uh, value systems. So what is ethical in one society is not in another. And second, um, a lot of the ethical issues are very complex and uh, really require, in fact, I was involved in trying to, to help redesign the, the curriculum for designers. And we thought that ethics was so important that we should not have a course on ethics <laughs> because it should be integrated to everything that you learn. So it isn't that you do something and then you step back and say, is this ethical? But even every little choice you're doing, you use an ethical framework to evaluate the choices you're making. Unfortunately, we failed. We failed because we couldn't find anybody who could who we couldn't find anybody that was acceptable to the rest of this design community working. Uh, so we had a team on ethics and they produced what we felt was an unusable report. And so um, we failed. And if you take a look at the ethical requirements that have done for each of the different fields, it often takes a team of people years to develop it. And even it can even take decades because the, the ethical requirements get tuned and changed as they get feedback. It's, it's a very essential problem, but like all very important problems, it's very difficult. So um, you, you say you don't touch ethics because it's another book, but it's very related. Um, would you like to you know, encourage writers everywhere here to, to consider what the book that, that, you, that you would like, that you could dream would be inspired by your book might be? 
some of the books? Well, <laughs> I, I, you're switching from ethics. I don't, I don't want to inspire someone to write about ethics unless they're an expert in ethics because it's, it's a complex thing and there are people who are true experts in understanding the ethical implications. But again, it's different for different fields and different cultures and different systems. So, um, but yeah, as, as I answered to um, Ben Schneiderman, uh, when he said, well, I just touched upon something, but the, the issue, we could do much better things with dynamic representations, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. And, and so I talk about a lot of topics that I just, I cover what I think are some of the major issues, and I always show how some people are addressing it in what I consider to be very positive, and excellent ways. But it's not enough for you to, it's enough to get you excited. And if you cared about it, then you could go off and do much deeper work and maybe write, yes, as you say, write the more detailed book for designers. Cool. Brandel, do you have uh, something you want to say? Uh, yeah. I'm, so, Something that I'm uh, increasingly sort of conscious of is that people are building a lot of really smart stuff. You know, in the past when people did graphic design, they would use rulers, set squares, pens, and pencils, and they they're complicated, more complicated than most people imagine to design. Um, but they they don't support you very much other than just doing exactly what they do, and as a consequence, they're intrinsically more composable into uh, whatever kind of system of uh, of construction or, or action that you have. Uh, the, as tools and, uh, and the systems that we live in get more complicated, um, they also get more rigid in terms of what you can compose and, and put together with them. So um, I'm curious whether there's any way out of that uh, from your perspective in terms of having, uh, how can we make things that people can turn into systems of meaning and production themselves rather than having to design every single sort of composition and, and, and corner case for them. Well, um, there are a whole, well, you've opened up again another rich topic. Um, the tools that, would, that have been designed, the CAD tools, for example, computer assisted uh, design, <clears throat> have been powerful. They relieved a, a, you know, people of a lot of the tedium of, of doing all the detailed work. And on the top of it, if you're, if you're doing a complex mechanical part, not only does this help you, but it could automatically do exploded diagrams. It could automatically show you different perspectives. It could automatically give you part lists and even look up what the costs of each of the parts were and therefore what the bill would be. And it could automatically do stress analysis and uh, do all sorts of things that are really valuable. So it was a complex system, but it was very useful. Now, um, we have now new ways of manufacturing, 3D printing, for example, or additive manufacturing, that is very difficult for people to do without assistance. Because if I want to know how to make something as light as possible, and it's, but with not any loss in strength, I have to know where I can have gaps, you know, holes inside the material. That, that can't be done by an unaided person. And so a lot of the tools allow us to do that. And so if you take a look at the designs that come out of some of the new new tools for designing with 3D printing, additive printing, additive manufacturing, uh, but they end up <laughs> they end up making these really beautiful, wonderful things. If you want something with straight lines, you, you can't get it very easily. Uh, and if you want to do something with straight lines, well, you can't get curves very easily. It's interesting to look at the automobiles over the years. You can tell you can tell the age often by thinking about how it was manufactured. Oh, that one is obviously they use the you know they, they, it's sheet metal which they would fold and bend and so on, and it's, everything's a straight line. Or they could do simple curvature, and then as, as advances went, they went to more and more fancy shapes and curves and so on. Um, will there be a tool that has is so flexible can do anything? Probably not. And the problem is that these manufacturing tools can be very expensive, so you can't have them all. Now, everybody is probably thinking about the new AI tools like uh, the new chat T GTP number four, which evidently can do almost anything. Um, and it is very flexible, it is very powerful. And we are going to get more and more tools like that, but those are tools in the 
in the mental side, in the cognitive side, and uh, not they're not actual working products. So I can imagine though that our tools will get more powerful, even in even for designing of physical objects. But I still think that 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 will make our jobs in many ways more pleasant because people, designers who have used the generative design tools that have come out of places like AutoCAD um, or um, is that AutoCAD, um, AutoCAD, Autodesk. Autodesk um, they often fight it at first, but after they've used it for a while, they say, I don't want to go back because it, it allows them to step back and be a real designer and think about it. Is this what I really want? And if it isn't, you have to learn to reframe the way you're facing, you're describing the problem, which is actually uh, you have to use chat. Yes, uh, and uh, to, to that end, uh, actually at Autodesk, uh, their, one of their high ups said uh, a while ago to me that uh, he was able to identify the specific version of the software that a given yeah. building or industrial design was constructed in as a consequence of the artifacts that were sort of known in there. Um, I, I think that the, the thing that I was trying to get at is that all of these tools, uh, the more elaborate they become, the more restrictive they are uh, in terms of having a, a conceptual modeling and a framing of it. We're all really familiar with the idea of having text editors that have bold and italic as settings, but we don't have uh, the, the idea that we might have ambitious rather than bold as a, as a way of denoting or delimiting a, a piece of, of text is kind of anathema. And that sort of just speaks to the rigidity of these tools. How do we make those more flexible so that people can construct better or their own mental models out of them? I, I think there are uh, composition tools, as you probably know, that give you huge flexibility, but that also requires a higher learning uh, time and uh, requires more skills. So this is again, one of those constraint problems, one of those trade-offs that um, if, I, if I really constrain what you can do, I can make it much simpler and easier to do. And if I start giving you more power to change things and I can have text flowing around and moving and maybe dynamic text and the shapes change, that requires a real skilled professional to use. And actually we do have a lot of those tools like that, but I think it's that trade-off that it's a long learning time. And uh, you could say maybe that's a good thing that shows that designers are going to always be needed as good professionals. Well, good dashboards are always going to be needed to make it so you can get to, for example, with the 3D printing printer I have, when I print something, I can't sand it because it's made the shell around it optimized for strength and, and, and thinness. Where if as a design, if I'm really making a mock-up, it's part it's partly to visualize it and change it. And you know, so on. Um, Alp uh, uh, sent a message in the chat that relates to this chat GPT thing you were just talking about. And I, um, you can maybe read it or I will. Um, given your expertise in human-centered design and usability, what are your thoughts about the role of artificial intelligence in shaping the future of user interface experience? And how can designers ensure that AI technologies are designed to be beneficial, ethical, and aligned with human needs? Um, once again, a really good question, but fortunately, we happen to have a world authority on that topic in the audience. Ben. Still there, Ben? Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> you want to take that question? Well, I uh, wasn't expecting that turn, but <laughs> thank you, Don. Yes, I've been focused on this pretty strongly, and... Uh, um, yeah, I, I do think there's, I, I'm impressed by chat GPT, GPT-4 and so on. Um, there are real dangers though. Uh, so I think, you know, the earlier question about safety from Jim Sporer comes, comes back on as being important. Um, so you want to, you want to, you know, I think we want to also ensure user control. And there again, I think the user experience community has a lot to offer the AI community. I've just been writing about the prompt engineering idea and prompt user interfaces. The AI community thinks that a blank prompt box where you type an English language question is the best and most flexible and powerful user interface. Not true. There are better ways to do it. And, you know, I mean, Amazon shopping is just one example. You may start with a short prompt where you type in jeans 
that you're looking for some genes, but then you get faceted menus and you get lots of other ways that guide you to, to the query refinement process and prompt refinement is really the next step. So there's a couple of new papers out there and tomorrow in the group note, I will, I will post that. There's a group I've been writing for so that human-centered AI Google group is the place to catch up on these things. I won't say any more and take time away from you, Don. Uh, but I think I think there's a lot to be done that the user interface community could do a lot to help make the tools safer and more useful. And there's a big community, by the way, who are very concerned about these issues. And um, so there's a lot of work being done to try to uh, try to use try to take AI, the, the, the good parts, the beneficial parts of AI and shape it into something that's useful. By the way, the word AI is very dangerous because, for example, we there's all sorts of things in AI that we don't even call it AI anymore. And you take a picture and there's a little rectangle around a person's face so that it actually automatically focuses and adjusts the exposure for that face. That's AI. Or in automobiles, when they drive and they detect that you're too close to the car in front so it slows down automatically, that's AI. Uh, it isn't just the chat boxes that are AI. Uh, but exactly. I mean, that's my favorite example also. and uh, uh, The perfect example of maintaining human control, but ensure it with lots of AI. So, you know, there's lots of AI in the digital camera to, as you point out, you know, do color balance, focus, aperture, even reduce hand jitter. But it's still your photo. You compose it, you frame it, uh, you zoom in. And then you click for your decisive moment. So you get what you want. And then you can edit it and fix it and, it's, and send it and share it. So it's the AI is there, but it is used as a tool to enhance human performance. And that's the transformational aspect. 30 years ago, only 10% of the population could reliably take good photos. But by now, with these tools that are so well designed, 90% of the population could take a pretty good picture most of the time. And so you get that transformational impact, but it requires great user interface design. And it's, you know, the design word needs to be part of the AI world as well. And the, uh, the new AI techniques, the, the chat boxes and so on, they require a lot of skill to use them well, because the proper way to use it is to give it a query and then evaluate what comes back and then reframe your query. And for doing paint, doing pictures, for example, artists have done wonderful pictures where they point out, it takes them perhaps a month to be able to get that picture right because you have to go back and forth and trying to reframe the way you're describing the problem. Programmers have said the same thing. I can get it to write code, but it doesn't do the right code. And I have to learn how to talk to it and describe precisely what I'm looking for. And and as Ben is pointing out, the tools that we give people to help them do that, well, they really don't exist yet. Hey, you know, the famous story of the, the Colorado State Fair where uh, an a, a, a artist used Mid Journey uh, to uh, win, the, win the fair. Well, he worked, he did 800 attempts with using Mid Journey. He worked for a month and then he imported it into Photoshop and other tools to tune it up to get what he wanted. So it was far more than an automatic process. Except and that story <laughs> gets less left out of most of the news. Yes, reports. the public complains. I see he used a computer and did it. And why does it, he get the credit? Well, he said it was a really work of collaboration and he worked very, very hard. Yeah. Thanks to Richard Miller in the chat. I see he's included the link for the Google group um, that uh, there's now more than 3,000 people on that. So if you want to join that tomorrow, Wednesday afternoon, there's once a week a note that goes out on that. Yeah. But thank you. I'll let it, I'll retract it, <laughs> return to leaving this to be Don's show. Thank you, Don. So thank Debbie, you. Debbie uh, Pirtis, Pirtis you ha has a question in the chat. Um, I see that the book talks about human-centric design. And the first thing that comes to my mind is accessibility. What is the future of accessibility? There's a beautiful conference that just happened, by the way. And is it possible to create a universal design that serves all humans, no matter uh, of their uh, ability um, of the human? 
Well, I'll answer the last question first, and the answer is no. <laughs> the, the, the complexity and requirements are much too great for to have any single simple solution. But I want to remind you that I don't talk about human-centered design except to say that's, that's the last century. Today, we're talking about humanity-centered design. And the difference is important because if you do human-centered design, that's the model that design that's the model that design is a tool of industry to increase the profits and the sales. And so we study individual humans and what they need. We don't take a look at the impact on the system. We don't look at the impact upon all of humanity, upon the ecology, upon other societies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we must take a broader picture. So it isn't just human, it's humanity-centered design. Now, I am a very big fan of, of designing things that are easier for everyone, regardless of their needs. And there's this wonderful book called, it's by, um, 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 I usually remember both the name and the book. I keep calling it Misfits, but the book isn't quite called Misfits. But it's basically the argument is Cat Holmes. Cat Holmes is the author. And uh, what she says is, you know, we're all handicapped. Uh, I'm carrying groceries in my hand. And so I only have one hand available to do things. Or, um, you know, I fell and I hurt myself and my hand is in a sling or maybe there's a bandage over my eye or uh, we all have problems every day. And it isn't just somebody who was born with, with a difficulty or had a serious accident. And so she points out how important it is to design it so everybody can use things that it almost invariably we design something to make it easier. It makes it easier, not just for the people with difficulties, but for everybody. I don't know how many of you have closed captions on right now, but I do. And my wife and I use closed captions all the time. It is not because we're hard of hearing, but we're, we have difficulty sometimes understanding the sound system or the, the way that people speak or different accents. So it's really good. And both captains, which were fought against by everybody, because it was just a small, small minority of people who uh, were deaf who needed it. Well, you go to any bar that has television sets, so they always have closed captions on because it's because we are all deaf because there's so much noise in the bar that we can't hear anything. And so, uh, yes, I'm a big fan of that, but. It's not going to be the case that there is a, sink, a simple solution for everybody because different cultures have different ways of behaving and different people have very different kinds of problems. And so, but we actually, that's a, that's a very important focus that has to be done. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, and uh, Don, are there some questions you want to ask us? The, you've got this 60 people here, a lot of your friends. Uh, um, you know, it's kind of a nice moment. Well, I'm hoping the book will actually change the way we train designers and the way designers work. But I'm also hoping that it's more than designers who are impacted. I'm hoping the book will be read by business executives. And I hope that it will actually impact uh, some of the economics that we take that take place because I really think the economists think they understand people and they have extremely unrealistic models of people's behavior in their economics because they assume people are logical and that people have lots of access to all sorts of information and neither of those are true and um, and it's well known again it's hardly me who first pointed it out I must be one of the first pointing it out because back in the 19 50s, I was pointing it out to my economic friends who, who simply sneered at me and said I didn't know what I was talking about. Well, fortunately, we've now had th at least three, if not more, Nobel Prizes given to behavioral economists. We're starting to actually introduce this into economics. The first one, by the way, was given to, to um, Herb Simon. When I heard it, I was driving my car and I and I, to the university, I went to the university and I rushed over to the economics department to my friends in economics and said, look, Herb Simon won the Nobel Prize. Isn't that wonderful? And they said, what a waste to the Nobel Prize. Well, the economics field has changed a lot since then. But um, I'm hoping, though, that 
what I'm bringing to the world's attention, I hope, is a lot of the different issues that, again, have existed before, and I've provided a different framework, and it's particularly one grounded in history, uh, and also uh, different ways of doing economics and representing the data, and concerned about sustainability and the issues that we must face in making a sustainable world, and then broadening our approach from human-centered to all of humanity. People complain that I'm using the word humanity centered, shouldn't I be saying planet centered or life centered? And my response is, look, I only had one word because I wanted to have centered and I wanted to have design and I had to choose one word and humanity seemed appropriate to me. It was, it's been a use for about 20 years. I didn't invent that phrase. And the other words that you talk about are good words too. And, but if you actually look at what you care about and what I care about, it's the same thing. But if you just want to describe it in a single word, well, no matter what word you, we choose, it's probably wrong. So what's important is how I define humanity-centered design or how you design, define planet-centered or life-centered or whatever. And it, we all mean the same thing. We have to take a systems view of the world. Sounds great. So, um... I, we've been we've been at it since for, for for several hours actually with you, Don. It's been a lovely evening. We had a some people joined seventeen people joined to talk about it at the dinner, um, and I just want to give people one last chance. You guys, um, this is a very rare opportunity to get Don Norman uh, not at his normal speaker fee um, to send, especially. I never especially. I never charge when I talk at Kai. Come on. I know. I'm just teasing. Or when I talk at universities and you've I'm you've never like charged. That. You've you've been very generous and and, and you always are. Um, so here we have um, uh, there there. Let's see. Um, we have uh, Richard Richard Miller raising a hand. Um, <clears throat> Richard Miller, could you speak? Hi. Yes. Thanks. Hey. So Don, you know the humanity thing. I love the idea. I think you know my, my preface is that. You know, the design of everyday things was something that a lot of people could read that weren't designers and they now knew what design was. But in, but since then, 300,000 people have become quote unquote designers, but many of them I'm finding in the field don't have that kind of, um, I don't wanna just say academic background, I wanna say like the science background. You know, they're coming from graphic design, but they're just, they don't, they don't learn the interaction design part. So they don't, they don't know that human factors part, the science, the psychology, you know, now with the chat AI, of course, it's a lot of linguistic stuff that we're working on. So I'm wondering, how do you think you can take something like, you know, the humanity part of your book and we can get it to people that maybe need to know, or do you think that we've missed the boat or do you think it doesn't matter, you know, that I'm sort of like saying there's this, I'll call interaction design, or lack thereof, of sort of those fundamentals? Well, design is a complex field. And um, I think that the education of designers has to change, but also, you know, the folks at the D School at Stanford and IDO did a great service to design when they started talking about um, design thinking because it, it actually made people realize that design is more than making something beautiful. They also did a great disservice to the world when they said you could basically learn the principles, you know, in a weekend or at a short course. And, um, and the problem is that that's not how they work when they do our professional. The design thinking thing that is taught is sort of the fun part of design. And it's in many ways the least important part. Uh, because actually what's more important that is than the doing the design, the design thinking part is only a small part of it. You don't face all the constraints and all the difficulties of putting something together that might work. But what's more important than doing the design is design doing, is creating something that really works. So uh, we have a lot of amateurs or we have a lot of people that are partially taught and they don't really understand the complexity of the problem. I, I sort of tell this, tell people that everybody's a tennis player, just like everybody's a designer. And that um, what has happened though is the everybody, not everybody, but let's assume lots of people play tennis or play some sport, 
and um, usually pretty badly. But the fact that you play that sport makes you appreciate much better the skills of the professionals. And uh, we haven't reached that point in design, though. People think that they understand design, but no, they are not at the professional level and they don't consider the issues that you mentioned in your question. So, um, but again, I think I, my feeling about humanity-centered design versus human-centered design is it's a very similar thing. There are four principles of human-centered design and my five principles of humanity-centered design are basically the same four amplified a bit in scope. And then a fifth, which is a, a general principle. Um, so the fifth has to do with when you're designing for a community. The fifth principle says, you know, the colonists, people from European countries and the Americas, would you go and discover unexplored lands and undiscovered lands and uh, take over it. And, and the people there were called savages, so we didn't have to think of them as people. Or in India, the British said, oh, we know how to govern better than you do, so we'll help you, we'll govern your country for you. Uh, that's bad. Well, that's what design does. Design sits and says, well, let me see if I understand your problem. Oh, I, yeah, and I understand a solution. Here it is, here's a solution, aren't you happy? I, I've shown you how to get clean water or better health or better education. No. When you work in a, in a society, in a different culture, it has to come from them. And there are 8 billion people in the world, and a lot of them are really very intelligent. And someone living in a culture, they don't need an anthropologist to come in and tell them what their problems are or how they live. They know that. And a lot of them have already started to address the problems. So why don't we build on that? And we have design with and design for, not design for people, but design with people. So we can come in and help them because quite often they're addressing the symptoms and not the underlying causes. And humanity-centered design says we should, be, we should be guides and mentors and facilitators and help them maybe get the resources to address the larger issues. But it has to be done by the people, not by us. That's the fifth principle. But that doesn't apply to mass manufactured stuff. That applies mainly to the important societal issues. Well, I think I think it actually might also apply to the other because um, this this idea of an extensible dashboard is back to extensible languages and 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 uh, and designing products that can be modified and and improved by people put together, as you said with the IKEA example. Um, and I, I think that there is uh, a lot of value in in uh, in trusting and respecting the users and giving them. This, the tools that help them be able to be creative themselves. Yeah, so actually let me expand on what you said because I'll give you two examples. One is the new additive manufacturing methods, the 3D printers, which are, are you know, they're getting to the point where they'll be just like Xerox or copying machines or printers. Like I have a copying machine and printer in my office and many people have their own in their homes. We could have printers in our homes to make all sorts of things. And some of them would be, we'll just find plans on the internet, but some of them will we'll design our own plans. So yes, we don't need mass manufacturing, but we have inexpensive printers that can do a lot of what we normally would buy in the store. And second, um, even the, the chat program, let's assume 10 or 20 years from now, uh, we could already, they already can do programming. They're still a bit awkward and it still requires a bit more skills and you still have to run it. But I can imagine where you could you could really tune something to exactly your desires by basically having chat, the chat successor, program it to behave the way that you would like in your home or your office. So yes, I think we would maybe the age of mass manufacturing will go away. So we have a, a couple more questions here. Um... Kibrakan, uh, can can you speak it or should I speak it? Um, so, uh, for a common person who has basic knowledge of design and uses AI, can uh, they believe that they can replace pro designer? Um, what is your thoughts on this? I believe it empowers everyone, and they can. Yes, I I believe that they believe that, but they'll be wrong. <laughs> Because we just talked about it. 
Now, I know. I know that it is the control to take the AI or to take simple 3D printers and do something that's worthwhile. And that's really good. And that is attractive and fundamental and you know, responsive and usable and all that. And so, but actually I wouldn't be surprised if some people start out that way. And as they, they realize they need more skills, they start developing it. And before we know it, five or 10 years later, they're really good designers, but it will take them five or 10 years. So um, one question that I don't think you probably have time to answer, but maybe you can point us to a list of books that you uh, respect or would uh, like people to consider thinking about um, reading besides your own. Oh, well, it just so happens I have a website. <laughs> I have two websites. My, my uh, website is JND, which in psychology means just noticeably different. It's a term from with a field called psychophysics. And so I am JND.org. Um, it's on my email and that's my website. So JND.org is my writings and other things. But I have a second website for resources for this book. The book is called Design for a Better World. DBW. So dbw.jnd.org uh, is where I list books that are relevant. I list all sorts of resources, but I'm listing books that are highly relevant to the topics in this book. And, um, I'm, and I keep adding to that list as new books come out. A whole bunch of them are coming out now. And uh, there's even a book by Bob, um, by Bob. Sorry, Bob, I lost Cosma. You. Cosma. Thank you. Uh, that is almost the same as this book. When I was, he sent a copy of it so I could maybe write a blurb about it. And as I was reading it, I told my wife, I'm reading my book, except it's written by somebody else. And <laughs> so it's really nice because he, he has many more case examples than I do, but it's the same themes. And so the two of us have gotten together actually to, um, actually with a bunch of other writers we're, we're trying to have a panel at the, at a design conference in Milan and um, in October and uh, but that's in the list that's in one of the books I recommend reading but again I have a whole bunch I have four books in a paper which is how I got started with those four books and then I have other books and then of course I don't list them but in here I have I don't know how many pages of references uh, that are described within the book. Well, it's really a great contribution, and we um, very much appreciate all of the effort and that you that you've been putting into creating this this knowledge trove that's going to be helpful to to everybody. Um, and you've done it for for decades for us, uh, and we are uh, all lucky to get to have time with you. And uh, and uh, this has been a very, very um, fulfilling evening, I think, for a lot of people, for everybody that's here. And so, Don, uh, with that, uh, if, uh, at uh, 8.58, I think we maybe should call it an evening. Thank you, Ted, and, th and thank everybody who's stuck with it. Yeah. Well, it's a great, it'll be on, uh, this will be on YouTube. Yeah. And it was great to see so many of you. Thank you. We're gonna put, you can point people to our calendar or to YouTube to, to see this evening as well. Great. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Thank that you. was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.